Hi, I'm Derek. Um, I am going to read, first of all, thank you for having me. And thanks to William. And uh, I'm going to read from um, a essay I wrote in 2008. It's from Judy Blame's obituary, which is um, a new collection of my fashion writings um, that's coming out from Pilot Press in London. Uh, it's coming out in January. It's up for pre-order now at Pilot Press, the Pilot Press's website. Um, and then uh, after January 20th, it'll be available in bookstores. Um, but feel free to pre-order it, pilotpress.co.uk. Um, I'm gonna read something um, called Zing, which is uh, partly about perfume and partly about uh, a couple of books that I wrote. William asked me to read another piece about perfume, I, which is littered with French words. And I tried to practice today and I can't pronounce any of them. So I'm gonna go with this. Um, it's called Zing. Zing, it's a French perfume. I wet my wrist. Zing by L'Artisan Parfumeur. It smells like shit. It's an animalic, a type of perfume with a fecal fragrance. When I sniff myself, I get a whiff of wet fur and asshole. Zing smells like circus animals, lions, elephants, bears, and the shit they shit. I smell other smells in it too. Sawdust, leather saddles, something sweet, cotton candy, caramel apples, or nuts. The show that smells. This is what carnies and circus folks call an animal show. It's also what I named my new novel. The show that smells is set at a circus. There's a midway, the story set entirely in a mirror maze. There's fashion. Elsa Scaparelli, the fabled fashion designer, is a vampire. Coco Chanel, the fabled fashion designer, is a vampire hunter. There's perfume. Scaparelli is selling Shocking, a perfume whose base note is blood. When humans wear it, vampires can home in on them. Chanel is selling Chanel Number no. 5, a perfume impregnated with holy water. When humans wear it, they're impervious to vampire assaults. I'm in it. I play a writer for Vampire Vogue magazine. Vampires, carnivals, couture, the show that smells is full of these things, as was my previous novel, The Haunted Hillbilly. In The Haunted Hillbilly, a vampire named Nudie made Hank Williams a star. He did so by making Hank Williams' suits, garish gabardines gussied up with sequins. The suits proved irresistible to the public. To the public. They glittered like the chalkware dolls that carnies used to give away at carnival games. Uh, for those who can see, the, I have some chalkware dolls behind me, although the tinsel is um, rusted and falling off. In the show that smells, Elsa Scaparelli sells shocking. It's made with blood from babies. Her haunt is a mirror maze, the perfect place for a vampire to prey on people. Like a scent, she has no reflection. No one can see her coming. I like to think that the maze's mirrors are akin to facets in a crystal flacon. Is being in a mirror maze something like being in a perfume bottle? The Haunted Hillbilly starred Hank Williams, country music's most famous singer. The show that smells stars Jimmy Rogers. In 1927, a nobody named Jimmy Rogers walked into a hat warehouse in Bristol, Tennessee. He had on a business suit and a boater. He'd come to sing, not to shop. The Victor Recording Company had set up a recording studio in the warehouse, hoping to find local hillbillies to make hillbilly records. Jimmy wasn't local. He hailed from Meridian, Mississippi. He was, however, a hillbilly. He sang some sentimental songs that sounded folksy. Victor released them. They sold strongly. At a Victor studio in New Jersey, he sang several more. T for Texas, also known as Blue Yodel, was one of them. It became a monster, a million seller. Jimmy Rogers became a star. He toured with Will Rogers. He recorded with Louis Armstrong. He shot a short movie in Hollywood. He strummed and sang before a backdrop of a railroad shack. Before being a singer, he'd been a railroad man, a brakeman on the Mobile in Ohio. The singing brakeman, Americans came to call him. Also, the Mississippi Blue Yodeler and America's Blue Yodeler. He yodeled the same yodel in almost every record he cut. He loved the hillbillies, the same as he loved the common people everywhere, 
said Carrie Rogers in her memoir, My Husband, Jimmy Rogers, and loved to be among them and with them. More than that, Jimmy loved circuses and carnivals. As a kid, he ran off with the circus, the big top bed sheets he borrowed from his brother's wife, the big act, him singing. He sang in Meridian, then tramped to another town. By the time his brother caught him, he'd made enough to buy new bed sheets. He ran away again. Local children were the circus acts. His tent was store-bought, charged to his father's account without his father's knowing it. As an adult, Jimmy owned a carnival. In 1925, he was a struggling singer driving around Dixie with a street show. Having bought an interest in the operation, he brought a carnival on board. It included a Hawaiian show, girls in grass skirts dancing daringly. Did it include games or rides? Did it include a freak show, an animal show? Books about Jimmy don't say. What they do say, the carnival was destroyed in a blowdown, which is carny slang for a big windstorm. Big Circus Tent. This was the name of a show he headlined in 1930. He was a star at this point. He toured it through the South. He shared the bill with Miss Helen, mentalist. The big top was red and contained a calliope and of course, hundreds of seats. Beyond the big top was a complete carnival, including rides, a midway, barking barkers, and minstrel shows. Jimmy's dressing room was a tent with screens and roll-up walls and a bed. After a show, he had to rest. It took him an hour to remove his makeup. He was dying of tuberculosis. He had a pricey collection of perfumes from France. He would sniff them. It killed the stink of sick rising from his lungs. Narcisse Noir by Caron. That was Jimmy Rogers' favorite perfume. In the United States, it was sold as Black Narcissus. The top note was orange blossom, the bottom Black Narcissus. Jimmy's nose was full of the fragrance of his liquefying lungs. I'm sure he would have loved a perfume that smelled like something sweet from his life, like Carrie or a carnival. Shocking by Scaparelli wasn't her first perfume, but it was her most famous. Introduced in 1937, it included notes of Narcissus. Its animalic scents came courtesy of ambergris and civet. Ambergris is a waxy substance found in the stomachs of sperm whales. Civet is oil from the anus of a civet cat. Scaparelli intended it to shock. Shocking was supposed to smell like panties, like post-coital pussy. She titled her memoir, Shocking Life. She named her favorite shade of pink, Shocking Pink. Shocking is also a sideshow word, shocking and amazing. See the living vampire, see the human worm, see a beautiful girl become a gorilla. In 1938, Scaparelli staged a circus in the street in front of her shop in Paris. Tightrope walkers trod high above the Place du Vendôme. Fire breathers breathed fire, acrobats acrobated. In the shop, Scaparelli showed her circus collection. It included a coat stitched with dancing horses. I want to add that. Uh, Sorry, I, I'm mentioning the, the circus collection because one of her most famous dresses was a human skeleton dress, which was black and actually contained the outline of a skeleton. Um, uh, it was based on people with tuberculosis. People in tuberculosis would uh, be hired by sideshows to portray living skeletons, human skeletons. And she made a dress that um, simulated that in wearers, which was a rather perverse thing to do. Um, Ruth Ford, the actress, um, who was Charles Henry Ford's, Henri Ford's uh, sister, uh, was one of the few people who received that dress. And um, she lived in the Dakotas and she lived to a very ripe age. But I remember Lynn Tillman telling me a story that um, uh, when she passed, a bunch of people went in uh, to her place to try and recover um, 
these great treasures of fashion and art that she had collected uh, and that her distant family, um, but her distant family had arrived there first. And so uh, it's thought that this great Scaparelli gown uh, ended up in a dumpster behind the Dakotas along with God knows what else. Um, anyway, I love that story. I mean, I wish it had been saved, but it's a great story. In the show that smells, I describe shocking as smelling the same as zing, sawdust, sugar, animal spores, and blood. When women wear it, they smell like a vampire supper. Vampires wear it too. Vampires love perfume as they have no sense of their own. They don't have body odor, they don't perspire. They're dead, so they carry a trace of cadaverine. Dogs detect it. Vampires prefer perfumes that camouflage them, scents that smell like living rooms or libraries or late nights. Vampires are perfectly or peculiarly suited for perfume. Perfumes flower on people. They're transformed by the heat of bodies. Perfumes stay the same on vampires. Vampires have no blood, no body heat. They're smelling strips. Do this. Smell the show that smells. It doesn't smell like paper. It smells like vampires perfumed as paper. Thank you. Is William back? William! I'm back. <laughs> God bless so, you. For your information, Spectrum had an outage, which is not going to be repaired for approximately two hours and I'm using the hotspot on my iPhone to uh, come to you uh, via the airwaves. And I apologize, but there was absolutely nothing I could do about it. Uh, so I think what I'm gonna do is start my reading all over again. And then Derek and I will attempt to have a normal conversation, as normal as we can be. <laughs> Thank you for Break filling in, Derek. Break a leg, darling. Thank you. Okay, so um, this excerpt comes from the narrator's second year of art school in the late 1990s. The other characters include his close friends and fellow students, Gregorio and Winston, and an, alum and an alumnus named Paul who graduated years ago, but can't stop coming back to campus. The highlight of the fall semester was an interesting roster of visiting artists, including Jack Goldstein, who was returning to the alma mater he had left about 25 years before. The films he showed were visually stunning, staging concise conceptual jokes in evocative images. Goldstein himself seemed the worst for wear. He was openly resistant to giving an artist talk and spoke with bitterness about his career. As far as he was concerned, everyone who was anyone had screwed him over. When the lecture ended, I saw Paul making his way to the door. I got out of my seat and followed him. Hey, what are you doing here? Paul turned around with a start and said, well, darling, you're a sight for sore eyes. I came to check out the new talent. And what should I see but a poster for the Jack Goldstein medicine show? We went to the student lounge where he held court on the subject of our visiting artist. Gregorio and Winston joined us. I asked, how do you know Goldstein? I have known him in the biblical sense, one could say. No, Paul replied. <clears throat> Excuse me, we were all nonplussed and Gregorio said, he's not gay. No, Paul replied, but a drug addict will do just about anything for a fix and some of the less scrupulous elements of society have been known to take advantage. You're a legendary whore, I said with grudging admiration. Paul shrugged and said, no, whores get paid. He raised his voice, gather round children and I'll tell you the cautionary tale of the great Goldstein. He cleared his throat and asked, did you know he was also a painter? We all shook our heads. In the postmodern sense, dearies, he used to refer to the assistants who produced his paintings by the demeaning term tapers because their work consisted of masking off with tape the parts of the canvas to be filled in with acrylics, like paint by numbers on a grand scale. Goldstein shows the source images, the color scheme, and with stunning cynicism, left the rest to his assistants. They are terrible paintings, Winston said with confidence. 
You'd be surprised, my young friend. They look ever so dolly in four-color repro, a masterpiece in every magazine. The market was sadly indifferent to those films and performances he talked about tonight. The way he really accumulated the fortune that went up his nose was by painting. Goldstein made his climb with the help of women he used like Kleenex. He fucked them, then abandoned each one when someone more powerful or solicitous came along. His whole strategy laid out, but he didn't understand the problem of the mid-career artist. The art world loves hot young things and it loves decrepit old survivors. In between, an artist can't get arrested. The vast desert of middle age when most artists disappear into academia has swallowed many a career. But the great Goldstein simply couldn't cope. He was the classic 80s cocaine addict, folie de grandeur for days, until he had to get some sleep at night. And that's when he started taking heroin. Once he made a few baby steps down Smack Alley, it was the beginning of the end. Soon his reputation and his bank balance were practically nil. The stories of his dissolution are legion. Once in an effort to raise cash, he sold the same painting under the table to three different collectors. Not the sort of thing a dealer will put up with, as you can imagine. After burning his bridges in New York, he worked his way west. First stop, Chicago. Then finally, the poor junkie landed on the West Coast, San Bernardino to be exact, where his long-suffering Cockney parents owned an abode of some description. I thought he was Canadian, I said, dimly remembering a press release. Paul continued, his mater and pater are East London Jews who immigrated to Montreal. Of course, when the good son made a killing in the art racket, they decamped to sunnier climes. Unfortunately, they were not set for life. Soon, poor Jack was soaking them for moolah rather than the other way around. Ma Goldstein had to take in sewing to make ends meet. But as much of a bastard as old Jack could be, he st people still loved him. Friends who knew him in his prime would ask, where's Jack, of any poor sap they thought would be sympathetic to their cause. If there was even a whiff of a clue, they would follow it up with a query, is he fat or is he skinny? The former meant that he was off drugs, the latter meant that he was using again. The great Goldstein spent his strangest period in East Los Angeles, in an RV without plumbing, surrounded by wild dogs and delicious gangbangers. I met him at that dire moment. It was long before your mother found religion, mind you, and I was still dealing illegal, illegal substances to make a living. Suffice it to say that that cul-de-sac next to the freeway was the scariest place I've ever seen. And I've had a gander at Nancy Reagan's twat. He's just a shadow of the man he once was, so bitter. <clears throat> I'd signed up for a meeting with Goldstein, and the next day he came to my studio about 25 minutes late. I decided to see him first thing in the morning. I guessed that whatever demons had driven him to his current state of ruin were more likely to descend as the day wore on. He looked at the bare walls of my studio and immediately said, you're not making any work. Why am I here? I directed his attention to a small combination VCR and television where I had queued up the video I made with Winston, American Dream, a bleak view of the master planned community of Santa Clarita. He sat through it without complaint and asked me, did you write that crap? It was a collaboration with a friend. Did you shoot it? Yes, he harumphed. That's the best part. This town has turned into something horrible and it's good you're showing it. So what do you wanna do, become an irrelevant experimental filmmaker? I'm not sure. Are all experimental filmmakers irrelevant? Yeah, it's been that way since the 70s. Don't they teach you that here? I can't say they've gotten the bad news. Goldstein turned and faced me to emphasize his point. The market is the only thing that matters in the art world. The only thing that matters in the art market is painting. Don't let anyone tell you differently. But I don't know how to paint. <clears throat> he became adamant. I'm a filmmaker and a writer, and I did performances too. I don't know how to paint either, but I made paintings anyway, and it worked too, until it didn't. I looked at his mouth as he said this. He had only a few teeth left and all of them were discolored. I could tell he was handsome once, but he had stopped caring about his appearance long ago. I had heard the junkies were avert to, had an aversion to water, and I doubted that he had bathed before coming to school 
As this occurred to me, he gave me a sidelong glance as though he knew what I was thinking. I asked, is being a painter the only way to be an artist? It's the only way to be the best. And if you don't aim for the top, why bother? The only real artists are the ones who can support themselves from their practice. These clowns who get teaching jobs in Illinois or somewhere are just posers. They don't really know what's going on. You have to develop a signature style distinct from everyone else, and that's not easy. Then you have to exploit it with the help of galleries that are at the same time exploiting you. The only way to make it work is to sell paintings for so much money that you can live well and say fuck you to everyone. Anything else is just a hobby. I think your films are fantastic, he bellowed. Who the fuck can see them? They're for a tiny audience and I never made a cent for them. Once he calmed down, I asked him, what do you suggest I do? He looked me in the eye once more and said, move to New York the minute you get out of school. It's the only place to live if you really want to be taken seriously as an artist. Don't hold back. You have to go at it full force and do whatever it takes to realize your ambitions. You have ambitions, don't you? I nodded. Then if you want something, go get it. And remember, there are a few hundred other assholes who want the same thing. He looked at his watch. He'd only spent 25 minutes with me, but he was ready to go. Can you take me to my next meeting? Sure, thanks for your time. As we walked to the studio of the person who was next on the list, he said, don't make the same mistakes I did. Everyone in the art world is a fucking monster, but I can't blame them for my problems. I did this to myself. Drugs help for a while, but they catch up with you in the end. Look at me. I was on heroin. Now I'm on methadone. Methadone is awful. Goldstein knocked on the student's door, but there was no answer. We waited in uncomfortable silence as he grumbled and fidgeted. Then, with an utterly bereft look in his eye, he said his parting words. I sacrificed everything to be a famous artist. I stepped on anyone who stood in my way. I wrecked every relationship I ever had. It wasn't worth it. Thank you. William. I really admire your recovery from that outage. You're like a old vaudevillian, vaudevillian pro. And I vamped. And I have to say, I had not printed out the whole essay because I was only going to read part of it. So I ad-libbed in the middle. Um, so I feel like we're like the gum sisters or something. <laughs> well, for those of you who don't know, the gum sisters <laughs> included Ethel Gum, who was, who later became Judy Garland. Uh, and they, they came from northern Minnesota, and they were a vaudeville act. And Judy was Miss Leatherlungs. From the time she was three, she could sing like an adult. And if you don't know this already, well, commit it to memory, because this, <laughs> this is queer history in the making. So I, I only have one question I wrote down for you. I thought that we'd start with that. And my question is, what are you, some kind of fairy? <laughs> well, I don't know what to make of that question. Um, somehow when I think of the, the word fairy, I, I'm always thinking of the army hearings with uh, Senator McCarthy. When someone asks in Congress, oh, what, what is a fairy? And uh, I mean, it's really, I mean, I don't know what to say to such a question. Well, Are you talking with the language of the 1950s? I'm asking because in this book, the first book of the novel, you say when you're growing up, that's something people would ask you. What are you? Some kind of a fairy. Well, they were and, all holdovers from the 50s. And you, you would say, I mean? yes. <laughs> yes, I am. Um, so people, I'm going to ask questions about, um, this is the first part of the trilogy. I'm open to anything. This is the second part, which we're celebrating tonight. I should have known better. Um, I watched you a week or so ago tell someone, wait, that one of these was like a YA novel. <laughs> Can you tell me which one is the YA novel and I'll recommend it to our tween viewers? Okay. <laughs> um, so 
this is this is based upon an assumption that I have, which may in the end be proven erroneous, but I believe that literary fiction, as it was conceived in the post-war era in the United States, is dead. And people are just picking at the corpse. There's nothing to see. There's nothing to experience. It's, it, there's nothing left. And even though literary fiction is dead and no one cares, genre fiction is alive and well. You go into a bookstore and you know, because you actually are working at a bookstore, people buy genre novels all the time. Horror, young adult, uh, suspense, mysteries. They're still very popular. And so one of the programmatic decisions I made in writing the trilogy was that I would try to write genre novels. And... In the first, I'm open to anything, the genre was pornography. And in the second, this was not actually my idea originally. This is something that somebody uh, suggested to me. He, he read the manuscript and he said, this is kind of a, a young adult novel. And so in the, in the respect that these are young people who are at school and they're interacting with each other and having experiences that really form their later lives and they're forming very intense friendships as one does at school. So that in that respect, it's a young adult novel, but I take it you have some skepticism about this assertion. Well, not completely um, because this is in fact about young people. I mean, university age people and um, it is not, there are cynical bits and there's Paul who drops in uh, with the Charles Nelson Riley voice. But in general, these are people becoming formed, you know, forming themselves, forming each other. And what's refreshing is it's not, uh, even though it's set at CalArts and there are some caustic observations that all these people have different talents. Some of them are very talented. Some of them don't quite yet discover what their talents are. So in a way, it, it is a beautiful version of being in university because these people do discover good things about each other. They fall in love and it's real love and they discover they have talents and it's real talent despite perhaps the cynicism of the visiting profs. Um, I remember when you were writing it, you said that it might be too bleak and I kept saying, no, actually I found it very, there's a lot of life in it. I mean, it, as there should be, in a book about university students, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, I think you had a different experience the second time you read it. The first time you thought uh, it's a little bit like the trashy rich kids at Bennington yeah. who fuck up. Yeah. And, and then the second time it was more apparent to you that actually these are talented young people. Yeah. Uh, and it's not entirely clear at first what their talents are, that, that that's, they're finding themselves. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's, I decided to concentrate on that. Um, well, I, I mean, and I think it makes sense too, because I think I'm open to anything is like a middle reader, um, in that it's this young man from Ohio, his father passes, he moves to California and he discovers a magic portal into a magical world, which we'll call fisting. So he's kind of drifting through the novel. And then he discovers fisting and it's really the lion, the witch in the wardrobe all of a sudden. Things, I mean, <laughs> things, <laughs> beautiful things happen when he discovers fisting. And it sort of has a Harry Potter vibe to me. I haven't read a Harry Potter book, but he discovers magic in the world. And that magic is this certain scene and these certain relationships and this certain sensations about fisting. Um, the second novel includes part of that, but it, it, yeah, it becomes more about love. It becomes about characters. There's a mysterious character named Temo in it. Um, what, what, what is your thought about fisting as a through line? Well, it was certainly the through line of the first novel. Yeah. And, you know, I, I mean, to, to, to make a comment on something you said a little earlier, 
for me, the form of the first novel is very linear and it is the narrator versus the world. Yeah. And what happens in the second novel is that it becomes much more complex and there are several characters and they form a kind of constellation or a group of planets. And they, they, they all have a kind of gravitational force. So they're orbiting each other, they're orbiting in different ways. And so it isn't linear. It's actually something that's it's much more complex, and uh, the you know the the formula that could be applied to the first novel doesn't work for the second. Um, and you know, I'm writing the third now, and the characters have really run away with it. Uh, the, I mean, one thing I, I I should say is that I have a kind of polemical relationship to my forebearers. And the experimental fiction of the previous generation is something I have problems with. Um, and I, I read a really interesting comment from, from Dennis Cooper. Uh, he wrote it on his blog, and I'll, I'll see if I can call it up here on my computer. He said in a piece called Rules of Writing, characters are not real people their designs with human names. And I don't agree. Um, for me, the characters are fundamental. And in order to have a novel, I have to invent characters. And those characters have to be interesting enough that I'm going to write them for a couple hundred pages. And working out the plot becomes the mechanics of the of the writing but the fundamental work is inventing the characters what say you to that mr mccormick well it interests me because i'm in the same camp as dennis except in my writing um the designs are the characters are designs with the names of people who passed but were famous so Den dennis creates characters based on maybe people he knows or i guess he does have rock stars and things in there but m m mine is taking scaparelli and chanel and emptying them and filling them with me um uh i i so they're design they're designer designs in my books which is fine it suits my conceptual purpose to be have designers be designs I will say reading yours, it is a return for me to character, by which I mean I have, it, the voices are distinct and the machinations are complicated. Although I will tell people who might not have read these books, um, the passage from the first book to the second book is seamless, though you can read the second book without having read the first, which is amazing. Anyway, it's, it's very planned out. Um, and in talking to you, I find that I have to reactivate a part of my brain, which is I have to remember characters' names because in my books, they're all me. They're me. And he, your characters are not all you. Though the narrator, I think, bears, a, you know, the, obviously there are elements of you in it. I don't want to confuse it with an autobiographical thing because it's not. It's, it's, it's really, y y th these characters are constructed uh, maybe informed by people that you know, but also by dialogue, by other art, by conversations, by politics. Um, so I will say that that interests me. I don't do it, but it interests me to read characters, you know. Um, it's very kind of you to be interested. <laughs> well, you know, because I'm, I think there are I'm others... mildly interested. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are others who would say this is completely passe. And oh, this, I can't say that about anything. I can't. There's, you know, there's a way to reinvigorate everything. There's a well, way to, there's a way to put energy and thought into everything. So I would never, I don't think that about anything I consume, art or movies or, um, or books. Um, now, mind you, this is me rebelling against my education because I got a rather fancy education. Right. And 
one of the, the canonical groups of texts that we were subjected to was the Nouveau Roman. Right. Which had enormous influence on a lot of writers of experimental fiction in the US. And so really for me, it was the dogma that I had to adhere to that a coherent character with easily readable motivations and understandable dialogue and interactions with other characters that made the plot go forward. This was all passe. Um, and, and I don't, I, it, was, it was something that really weighed down on me for decades. And it, I think it prevented me from writing as right. I truly am meant to write because uh, I, I, I don't see fiction that way. I need, I need characters to latch on to. And um, I, 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 well, well, the one thing I can say is there are readers who are appreciative. This wasn't originally intended to be a, a, a trilogy. I thought, oh, I'll just write one novel and see how it goes. It'll be an experiment. And uh, after the first novel came out, many people said, what happens next? We want to know what happens next to the narrator. No one has ever said that about my books, but keep going. <laughs> <laughs> what do they say about your books? They say there's not going to be another one, is there? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. Oh my God. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I want to ask you, I want to jump in because, it, it, you know, given the transition from the first to the second, what's interesting is you find out what happens but the, the, the kind of book is different. So what is the third book? If the first book, if the second book is a YA structure and the first one is pornographic, what is the third one going to be? Well, that's still up in the air because I've only read, written about a hundred pages of the third novel. And in my experience, the novels go through a lot of changes after the first draft. So I've only got half of a first draft, if that. But um, what I am discovering in the third novel is that I'm writing a lot of dialogue sequences. And this is something that terrified me when I was just starting out. What? No, I'm, I'm super interested in that. And, and yeah, I write, I'll write a whole chapter and I'll feel like I'm Ivy Compton Burnett. Ivy, I mean, this is a, like, you know, if you haven't read Ivy Compton Burnett, she's really something. She's, she's like from another planet. She's yeah. incredible. And she's someone I admire. I don't know if I love her work, but I admire it. And I admire her as a persona. And she would write very long dialogue sequences, almost like she was writing a play. And an editor once complained to her, we, we can't tell who's speaking in this. Could you please add some functional figures of speech so we get what's going on? And um, she, her response to that criticism was, to the beginning of the dialogue, she added, he said, <laughs> and that's it. And so the way the third novel is going is I'm writing these whole dialogue sequences, a whole chapter might be dialogue. And then I'm writing, he said, she said. <laughs> Does it feel theatrical to you? No, not at all. I'm still thinking with the mind of a novelist. Right. Um, and I do, I do actually set the scene. I do talk. I like, oh, well, we all drove to the Getty and saw a screening or, you know, something like that. Or we met at the HMS Bounty and this conversation happened. Um, but it's a very funny thing because at, the first novel doesn't have a hell of a lot of dialogue in it. And um, what, what I'm discovering is that in some sense, the characters have a life of their own. And they're they're really taking over the third novel, and it's becoming all about these dialogues between them. It's true the characters do have lives of their own, but I know people keep asking you, "Are these? Who am I? Who is this person? When did you do this?" Yeah, that's a burden. <laughs> I confess. Um, so so just you know to talk about the technique of my writing a novel i make the fictional world as historically accurate as possible so in the first novel i did research like well was that bar open in that year 
And one of the last things I did, did as an editor was I composed a timeline for the book. Oh, well, this actually, this episode happens in fall of 1996. And then I had to look things up, like, well, did this restaurant really exist at this location in 1996, et cetera. And then the second novel is based, or is, is set mostly in, at CalArts. And I made it as realistic as possible and mentioned all kinds of historical details that were, that were correct. So people get this notion that there's something autobiographical about the novels, that these things, quote unquote, really happen. But within this highly realistic uh, narrative space, I write fiction. I, all the characters are fictional and their interactions are fictional. Their dialogue is, although the dialogue, I do, I do steal a few things um, from people I've known. And I, you know, it's, 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 it's actually great compensation for having a memory that's a bit overactive. Like I, I remember things that people said to me in the eighties and they torment me and the, I get to put them in a novel and exercise the ghosts. Do they, does the torment end? Oh yeah. Um, at 7.54, so I'm gonna ask you one final question and then maybe hopefully people in the chat will have questions for you. Um, it's about fisting again. <laughs> uh, after you fist in the novels, you go out for dinner. That's what happens. Does it fisting make you really hungry? I know the people getting fisted haven't eaten maybe for a day. Yeah, in order to be really clean, you have to fast. Yeah. And it depends on how devoted you are to the practice and how deep you want to go, so to speak. Uh, <laughs> for some people, they just have to clean themselves out. But for other people, they fast for 12 or even 24 hours beforehand. And after the scene is done, the person who got fisted is ravenous. Right. Because first of all, the whole thing took a lot of energy. And second of all, they haven't eaten in a long time. So uh, that's a logical thing. Like you, you, you have this sex scene that plays out. And if you have an interest in your partner, if that partner is a human being to you, you go eat with them, you right. go have a meal. And then that's when, let's say, the story of that person's life comes out. And that's a formula for the first novel. There's a very heavy sex scene, and then there's uh, a, a dinner date or a lunch date, and then there's a long conversation about the life of the person who just got fisted. And your skin, is it moisturized? Is it dry? <laughs> <laughs> Does it smell? One, one must take very good care of one's skin and nails. Right. Really. Right. You know, anything is a potential hazard. Any any hangnail or little. So you can't leave oh, this ring on. I couldn't. Wear oh that no, ring. no jewelry at all. No, no. But you know, it's it's it's. There's something uh, very precise and very caring about fisting. Uh, people really have to be very careful and that they don't injure someone. Right. Um, and I think I think that's admirable you know, in a world where people are on their phones and things happen instantaneously, this is actually a sexual practice that requires preparation and care and a kind of intimacy that's not typical. Right, right. Well, Don't I get to ask you questions, Derek? Uh, you get one question. Oh no. <laughs> uh, what question could I possibly <laughs> ask? Okay, here's something. Okay. We, we, we talked to prepare, this, to prepare this event. And I remember bringing up the word incantations. Yeah. And I think particularly with The Well-Dressed Wound and with Castle Faggot, what you're writing are almost like magic spells. Right. And, you know, you're not very productive. You write very little text. And I think that one of the reasons is that actually what you're writing are incantations that have a power to them. And it takes a very long time to perfect those texts. What do you think about the incantation as a way of, of describing what you do? Uh, I think it's true. And in part, I think it's true because I have to explain what I do somehow. I mean, I have to explain the constant, I mean, I've been working on the same page for, 
14 months, you know, and I, I know some writers say, oh, I'm stuck on a scene or I'm stuck in a chapter, but I'm talking the same 400 words. And uh, to release me from that takes a certain precision, a certain rightness, a justness that I, I don't know how to do until I'm sitting down and redoing it. Um, I will say it reminds me of when I was younger, someone asked me what I wanted to do in fiction. And I said, well, I want to write something that will destroy all the books in the world. And to me, that seemed like a really worthy pursuit that if I could write some, well, you, so what I'm saying is a spell, you're right. It's a spell that will destroy all the books in the world, including mine. Um, why do I want to do that? I don't, I don't know. Um, but it feels like uh, the writing, um, I guess not all incantations um, and spells involve rage and revenge, but I bet a lot of them do. The ones I like do, you know? And uh, so yes, if I could get it right, I could obliterate everything. Um, I've never gotten it right. You know, if I think it's, I've learned now, in fact, that I can go years thinking it's right and it's not right. And that is my brain letting me rest, letting me sleep, letting me go on to the next thing. Uh, an interesting thing about Judy Blame's obituary is that I'm going back and looking at things that are 15, 20 years old and they're not right. Um, and I'm not changing them. Um, you know, I'm changing them here and there, but uh, it reminds me that, you know, even when things are right, they're not right. Although I have to say The Well-Dressed Wound to me is my favorite book because I feel the incantation is strongest there. And I, I think it ties into the idea of a fashion show as some kind of a ceremony or maybe like Whitman's poems, which are like parades. There, there's something about the processional nature of The Well-Dressed Wound in fashion that I think I got right. Um, that said, you know, I wrote The Well-Dressed Wound thinking I was going to die any minute. So I had to get it like I fucking had to get it right. And now that I've been alive nine years since cancer and grown lazy, I'm back to my old um, working on things for 14 months. Well, I have to say, I associate this incantation with the fear of death. Oh, and and that in a way you're saying a spell so that you will stay alive, so that you will survive another year, another day. And to me, that's enormously powerful. Well, thank you. I mean, that's very interesting. I haven't actually thought of that. I, I often, th I, I think of The Well-Dressed Rune as a book that's an incantation to make, I don't think I'm going to live. So I think, what can I do to make the afterlife bearable? And the answer was to have nice stores. But, you know, if I can somehow, if I can somehow arrange the afterlife so I can go shopping and wear nice clothes, then it will be, bear death will be bearable. It's imminent, but it might not be the worst thing. Um, I don't really think that. I think you're right, because I live with a fear of death that like overwhelms me 25 times a day. Um, and something I also think is admirable you, we, we discussed the phenomenon of the cancer book. And, and when an author survives cancer, there is a kind of unspoken request on the part of editors and people in the literary establishment where they say, oh, do your cancer book because it'll get really good reviews. Nobody yeah, wants to make fun of a cancer survivor. And you have refused that fatuous formula you have made your cancer books. I mean, everything from the well-dressed wound on is a cancer book. Yeah. And it's not something which is heartwarming and sweet and instructive. It's something which is uh, very different and uh, incantatory is the way I thought about it. Uh, and, and that to me is a very interesting decision that you weren't a good boy and wrote a nice, you didn't write a nice cancer book. I wasn't, I, I feel sometimes like, you know, when you write a cancer book, it's the one time in your life that you are guaranteed sympathetic readers. And I fucked that up. And um, in part, 
it's because I don't want to write one of those books. In part, it's because I think my cancer was better than everybody's. I mean, I had the mother of fucking surgeries. So um, I don't have to prove myself. Um, and But, you know, in, in a more simple way, it's just me shooting myself in the foot the same way I always do. But, you know, it's lively. It's a lively life when you do that. Um, but thank you for saying that. Um, I want to congratulate you on the books. I can't wait for the third one. For whatever genre it fits into. And I'm going to throw it, as they say, to Rubicon and see if anyone's asked any questions or said anything mean or nice. Rubicon. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Hey guys. Hi. Thank you for those readings. It was great. Uh, we're going to open it up to the, uh, to the audience now, but I, I guess I'll, I'll start with a question. Um, and I guess this, this is for the both of you because um, I, I actually, I, I see so many similarities, but also, you know, obvious differences from, from your novels. Um, I, I'm curious. I mean, I guess maybe this is more, Maybe William has thought about this because he makes films, but 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 the both of you have you ever thought about uh, uh, taking these these narratives onto a screen? Um, I mean, I, with William's novels, I, I it's it's maybe more clear to see. But then I, when I read Derek's your 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 novels, I, I also I, I feel like I, I see a stage or I see I see voices speaking from from behind the curtains, voices coming from all over the place. Um, have you ever considered doing any any type of uh, of cinema type of, of, of stuff with your work? Uh, no, me, I'm too lazy. Um, that said, I had the great fortune that The Haunted Hillbilly was made into a musical in Canada that played for over a year in different cities, and there was a soundtrack for it. Uh, and then the show This Mills was made into a puppet show that I really, really loved. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, I'm not a film connoisseur and I'm not a, theat a theater goer all that regularly, but um, I do think that books are a performance. I don't think they're a communication tool so much as a performance. So I love to hear that you smell the stage paint and hear the whispers backstage. <laughs> um, that really thrills me and excites me. And especially in the show that smells, which I sort of wrote thinking, Oh, I wish Todd Browning would direct this. Um, I really tried to translate that into words. Um, I wish I've always wished the guy Madden would make one of my, he blurbed the show that smells. And I always wish that he would make one of my books into a film. Um, I was lucky enough. My best friend, Jason McBride edited his journals and as a present for Jason guy and I made a movie together um and i can't remember the title it was like the ecstatic uh bliss of catnip or something we filmed i bought a catnip santa and we filmed a cat attacking it on a christmas tree and only one copy exists and jason has it but um i was really hoping i could sweet talk him into you know into doing something of mine and the thing is he doesn't need my ideas you know at all guy madden is fine by himself but, uh, and I know that William likes Guy Madden too. So I, I hope that he can, uh, I hope he can, maybe William, you could, do you think Guy Madden would be good? Should I hire him? Should I, should my people approach his people? <laughs> well, I think, you know, <clears throat> it's very appropriate because Guy Madden is the great Canadian filmmaker. Yeah. And he's still alive and he's a weirdo. <laughs> he's an unapologetic weirdo in a way that a lot of other filmmakers don't feel they can be. Yeah. And so if you've got a shot with anybody, I think Guy Madden is the one. Uh, I, I think he would have to find a way into the material. It's a shame you haven't written any books about hockey players. <laughs> because I think that's an obsession of his. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I won't go any much, I won't go much farther with that. Um, I mean, you know, in my case, I live in Los Angeles, the center of all media. And 
I live two blocks away from ABC Studios and the crappiest offices on ABC Studios lot are for the writers and they have windows that face the street. So I can look in and see the plans for episodic television. So like, oh, a whole season of Grey's Anatomy, they're writing it all at once and they're coming up with ideas in the writing writer's room and they're posting uh, cards all in a grid all over a, a whiteboard. And um, so th this logic is something that I have all around me. Now, in the first novel, I assumed that no one would want to adapt it because of the fisting. I, that was my guarantee. It's like, oh, there's not going to be a film adaptation because there's fist fucking in it. Wouldn't you know, via Instagram, a filmmaker contacted me about adapting the damn novel as a film. And I have, I have put him off. I have, it's typical Hollywood, baby. It's like, oh, let's talk about it later. You know, it, that sounds very interesting, but not committing to anything because I don't know. I mean, I, I, I did say I would like to finish writing the trilogy before I even entertain the idea of an adaptation because I wouldn't want the adaptations to have an adverse effect on the writing of the trilogy, the shape of the trilogy. I want it to have a life of its own. Uh, but it is, it is a, you know, in the second novel, I write about Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, in, I write about movies all the time. And I have to say, it is for me, it's not just a question of literary re uh, references or literary influences. I think about filmmakers all the time when I'm writing. You know, today I was just looking at W.C. Fields films. I don't know what I'm gonna do with that material, but that's what I do sometimes for, in for inspiration. It's not just me with a pile of books, although clearly I've got a pile of books too. I've also got, movies I'm looking at and TV shows. So I think I know that maybe that's an answer to the question. I, I think we have a two part question here. Let me, let me look at this real fast. Is that, uh, or wait a minute. Well, it, it, it's a two part question, but it's, it, they're both directed to Derek. Oh, okay. So here we go. The blank images in your book, I, I'm, I'm he must be referring to the last two books. You right. ask the audience to imagine the image. Is yeah. that because you know we'll think of something more terrible than what you can print? Yes. Yes. Uh, it's because one, the images I'm thinking of, I can't get clearance to publish. Uh, two, uh, the images that turn me on the most are maybe I can't explain why they turn me on. And uh, three, yeah, I hope you project something really, really uh, frightening onto it. Um, something real, something half real. Um, uh, and also, you know, I'm, to be honest, my books are so short, I have to think about page count. So if I can put in blank spaces, it really helps it have a spine that I can write my name on. I'm gonna be honest. How long does it take you to write something like Castle Faggot? Uh, that took me 10 years. Wow. Uh, I started that, uh, yeah, 10 years ago. Uh, I had it. I had it. Um, I had the part about the puppets. The, the, for those of you who've read the novel, for all, <laughs> for all seven of you who've read the novel, <laughs> the fourth part, the puppet show I wrote first, uh, and then I realized, oh, I'm going to try and publish this. And I haven't said what I'm going to say. When I say said what I'm going to say, I mean, put in things, lines that I liked. So uh, uh, I went back and did it. But it took me a long time. I mean, that said, I started it before I got really sick. I got really sick. I wrote The Well-Dressed Wound, which was kind of a cri de coeur. You know, it was really a rage against the world. And then when I realized, oh, fuck, I might live, I went back to it and expanded it. Okay, here's our second part of the of the first question here. Let me see here. There is a part 
where nudie makes sequins out of flesh. I think this is a reference to the to the uh, haunted hillbilly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a part where nudie makes sequins out of flesh. Is there some truth to how sequins are actually made or made, question mark, cow bones, gelatinia? Yeah, it's exactly Gelatin. right. Um, uh, not the first sequins. Uh, I'm going to say before the 20th century, they were often made of metals, uh, various material, but um, at a certain point, gelatin became the thing to use. And gelatin, of course, is bo boiling... Uh, the bones of animal carcasses straining it off and using it um uh in fact gelatin sequins are uh they've often they've deteriorated at this point if they're from the early 20th century but they were they reflected really brightly they painted really well uh i'm glad someone asked this because in judy blames obituary there's a story i wrote called spangle is a synonym for sequin and i interview a man who started making sequins in the thirties and really became famous making them for uh, the Jackie Gleason show, but really for Sonia Henney, the figure skater. And he told me that the gelatin sequins she would use were brilliant, but if she touched the ice, they could actually freeze to the ice. I mean, they were very, uh, as a material, they were very volatile. Uh, William, uh, there's also an essay in the, in the book about Jack Smith, um, and about Vera West, who designed uh, costumes for universal horror movies. And uh, there's a lot about um, the decomposition of celluloid after gelatin celluloid became the, the, the sequin. Uh, um, it, it became what sequins were made of, and it held its, as you know, as film guys, it has its own problems uh, with flammability, with decomposition, with turning pink or at least screening pink. Uh, but I will say as a short answer, yeah, yeah. They were, uh, you would get gelatin from boiling the bones of carcasses at uh, slaughterhouses. And in the haunted hillbilly, he uses human bones and they sparkle beautifully. I think I think we are out of questions, but you know, I let me let me just put it to the both of you. What if you could tell us just a little bit about what what you are uh, what are you working on next? What are you what are you thinking about um, taking taking your work next, William? Oh no, you should go first. No, you go first. Okay. Um, obviously, I'm working on the third novel, and. Uh, you, you know, I don't want to do any spoilers for the second in case there are people who are watching who are haven't, haven't read the second novel yet. But uh, there, there are some mysteries at the end of the second novel, and they have to get solved in the third novel. And so perhaps the third novel is a bit of a mystery novel or a crime novel. That's, you know, something that I'm working out in the third novel. But the terrible thing about working on the third novel is I, I reached a, a writer's block of, at about page 100 and I got an, an idea for a fourth novel. <laughs> God, what is my problem? I mean, yeah, what is wrong with me? I, 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 it's also a kind of extended career suicide because the art galleries that represent me, they, they're happy that I'm publi publishing books and I'm out in the world, but I'm not making much visual art right now. And um, it, is, it is a little strange that I've uh, derailed this career in visual arts to do something that earns far less money in the society. Uh, and it's a kind of compulsion that I can't I can't really do anything about. <laughs> and I like to think I'm pretty good at it too, but I don't know. How about you, Derek? Well, when you ask what's wrong with me, I feel I should answer. <laughs> I know, I just tell it, said what's wrong with me, so you might as well have your turn. I have a couple points to make. One, William, I just took half an Ambien. <laughs> Two, 
William should mention that apart from these amazing novels he's writing, you have a show, a big show in the spring at the very new David Kordansky Gallery, which is opening in Manhattan, in Chelsea, I believe. Yes. Um, yeah, the, 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 he's he's opening a space in New York, and um, I'm the second solo show scheduled for the space, and it will be a, a, a show of videos, many of which have not been shown in New York before, so it's a big deal, and it opens in June. Isn't that great? I'm very excited for that. Uh, yeah, I, I guess would... my career isn't quite as moribund as I'm letting on. <laughs> Mine is. <laughs> so... Uh, what am I working on? I'm working on the same fucking page 14 months later. Um, I'm working on, I have this book of fashion coming out. And then what I've been working on for a couple of years is a collection of jewelry that is going, I'm going to show the world along with writing. I'm, I'm writing an essay about how important the jewelry is I'm making so that I'll be able, the world will be able to know instantly Wait, you make you make jewelry, Derek? Well, I've been making it in secret for a couple of years. I've never shown anyone. And I decided, oh shit, I'm going to do it. I'm going to show people. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna make art. Um, but I'm gonna write a text that can tell people that they should love it. So I'm hedging my bets. I'm showing, I'm very hesitant to show artwork, but I'm going to do it and I'm going to write something that compels people to like it. Um, but that said, 14 pages, same, or 14 months, same page. That's very normal for me. I'll have a breakthrough at some point and finish. Um, but what I would love to do is like a book of the jewelry and the writing together, um, which is totally new for me. I've never done anything visual. I have collaborated with artists like my collects here in Canada. Um, I have written about artists like my friend, David Altmed. Uh, I've, oh, actually I collaborated in secret with my friend Vincent Fecto in San Francisco, which we've never shown anyone the stuff, which one day when we're dead, maybe it'll show. So it's been, um, it's been in the periphery with me and I've loved doing it. And so I'm going to try and do it on my own. So I'm actually the reverse of, William. William is an artist who started writing novels and I wrote novels and I'm going to try at this advanced age to show my art. And yeah, well, <clears throat> one thing I want to add to this, the uh, art school experience of, I'm, uh, of I Should Have Known Better is based in the late 1990s at CalArts and I was not a student there at that point, but I was teaching there. And one thing I discovered among the students is that they had their official work that they would show in critiques. They would show the faculty. They were, it was easy for them to admit that they made this work. And then they had their secret body of work. Wow. And one of my goals in speaking to students was to get them to show their secret work, the stuff that they thought was too embarrassing or somehow too vulnerable to show in a form of critique. And that I feel as though we're both doing that. We're both making secret works that we're finally now making public. I love that. That's true. Do we, we have, have time to... for a few more questions? Sure. Okay. Um, let's see here. An obscure question for William. You mentioned both J Chatterton's books in a bookstore called Bolan Bolzanos? Bolzanos. Bolzanos yeah. in the first novel. Yeah. Chatterton's, of course, was a real spot in Los Feliz, but I've never heard of Bolzanos. Is this a stand-in for what is actually Ald Aldine books? Aldine books? Who's, who's asking this question? Uh, uh, Dave? Oh, yeah. Dave Ehrlich, dude, oh, yeah, there we you go. caught me. You caught me, Dave. <laughs> I wrote that fucking book and I talked about Aldine's and then I thought, oh shit, it's still open. And it, it still is open today. It exists near Los Angeles City College. It used to be in my neighborhood, but it moved. And I never thought about it after it moved. I thought it went out of business. But I thought, oh no, I'm going to get sued. 
so I gave it the name Bolzano because uh, Bolzano is a city in northern Italy, and Aldine was actually the name of the first. It was, I think, it was the first commercial printing press, uh, and it was in Venice. So I just went up the the river to um, Bolzano, which is a city that actually is in the German speaking part of Italy and a place I've been. Uh, that's kind of stupid, but yeah, Bolzano's is based on an, a real bookstore, but I didn't want to get sued. So I changed its name. Okay. That, that's another one. Some fucking trivia, man. <laughs> this, this is a, this is another one for you, William. This, this is kind of a, it's kind of a big question. Um, I noticed that you use both AIDS and artists committing suicide as themes in your work. Is there a connection for how artists and homosexuals are treated in society? It's funny you mention that because in the second novel, um, there's an extended uh, section of the novel about Mike Kelly. <clears throat> and he, he, was, he grew up in 50, 1950s, lower middle class suburban Detroit. And he didn't grow up in an environment that was very cultural. It didn't have a lot of um, a lot of resources, and there wasn't much cultural capital in his family life. And this is a big contrast. You know, a lot of people who go to art schools who become artists, they have parents who are academics. They have parents who are artists themselves. They have parents who, you know, fill the house with books, take their children to museums. And actually these kids get to meet real working artists. But uh, that's a much less common experience in the American Midwest where the narrator comes from. And it was the case with, with Mike Kelly. And it was one of the things that made him such a unique artist because he was, he was working from references that were not the typical references you would get from the cultural elite, so to speak. But uh, one of the things he heard over and over again when he was a kid, and I got this from one of his interviews, the attitude uh, in Detroit was, well, art was something that communists and homosexuals did. And I thought, if only that were true. I love that idea. So in a way, all of the novels I'm writing, they're the artwork of communists and homosexuals. <laughs> How's that for an answer? What do you say to that, Derek? <laughs> um, well, like many homosexuals, uh, I was promised some kind of homin turn situation where homosexuals are in charge of culture. And it might be true, but I'm not one of the people that's in charge of them. Like, I, I, I got kicked out of that club. I, I got no fucking power. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, I don't, I don't have that membership card either. <laughs> I, I think it's one of those things that can cut either way. You can either, either have some advantages or you can actually be suppressed because somebody in a position of power looks at you and says, you're not the right kind of homosexual. Yeah, I'm not the right kind of homosexual. I mean, in that I don't actually have homosexual sex, but that's another story. And uh, I think just uh, it's changed. Yeah. Uh, when I was growing up, uh, uh, homosexual writers had a lot of importance. But to your point about literary fiction dying, I mean, I feel like gays don't read, fags don't read a lot of fiction anyway. And if they do, it's the same six titles uh, that they plug, that they write about, that they book club. I beg to differ. Yeah. But I don't know exactly what to make of this. Uh, we Heard You Like Books did a crowdfunding campaign for I Should Have Known Better. And it was really successful. And I'm very grateful. And Jared Kobeck, the publisher, he, he texted me the first day of the crowdfunding campaign. And he said, are you aware that all your fans are either Latino or Muslim? 
And it actually came as news to me. Uh, so perhaps the, how shall we put it, the privileged elite of white homosexuals, for them, literary fiction is dead. But there are other kinds of homosexuals out there and they're reading books. Well, that's and very, ex it's very exciting. That is very exciting. You and know. I loved, I love the notion that I'm writing for them because uh, it's, it's actually kind of a thrill to be wanted. It's a thrill to have an audience. And the thing that I've understood is that even though I'm flying under the radar of American literary culture in a lot of respects, I actually have this very interesting relationship to an audience. And uh, I, I treasure that because I think a lot of people are working in a void. I will say I agree with that, that William, it impresses me um, that you do for sure have a devoted following and it seems to be growing. And uh, that is very exciting. Uh, I work in a bookstore and uh, fashion prevails. You know, uh, people do not have, people can have a favorite novel and not like the next novel by that person. It's not a sustained interest in a voice. I thought you were going to say people can have a favorite novel and not having, and, and, and not read it. Uh, they can also do that too, because reading yeah. is secondary to buying. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and the one thing I can say is I, I do have some concrete proof of this. People don't return my books. You know, I went, I went on a book tour and you get returns that are still shrink wrapped and you can sell them on your tour. And of true homosexual experiences, I got nine copies and I said, Jarrett, get me some more copies of the damn book. He said, that's all the returns we've had. Wow. From a print run of 2000, we had nine returns. And then I asked just out of curiosity, how many returns did you have for I'm open to anything? And he said, three. Wow. Um, so these books are actually going to homes that love them. They're like puppies from a shelter. They're going to, to the right homes. And I'm very happy. Whereas my books, if someone says I sold a book of yours today, I say to whom? I inevitably know who they're going to say. It's my second cousin, my former neighbor. <laughs> There's no one reads my books that I don't know personally somehow. Uh, so I admire that. And I, it became clear in your fundraising and um, and that's exciting. I mean, I think in a way that's a way that you are like Dennis, that uh, you have an audience that loves your work and that returns to your work and wants to see where it goes. Uh, that is not as common as one would hope, I think, in publishing. And I say that as a bookseller. It's just not as common to uh, stick with someone to see what, what happens. No, no, I, I have to interject here, Derek. I, I, uh, I actually, I, I just looked at my copy of the Haunted Hillbilly yeah. that I've had since 2003. I couldn't believe it the other day. It's almost been two decades. I've been uh, a fan of yours. So there's, there's one. That's very uh, nice. But how did you find it? Well, you know, that's what's so funny about it. Because I remember I mentioned this to William back earlier this year. Um, how I'd been a fan of yours for so long. And then it wasn't until uh, last night when I was kind of putting together notes about everything. And it, it's, it's certainly from that village voice from 2004. And, you know, it's, it's just, you know, it's so interesting how important, you know, something like the village voice was, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. And, and the village voice was important to me that year. They had the haunted hillbilly and they had a, an anthology book I did with Dennis Cooper's press called, um, grab bag and the only thing comparable which has come out of it is book form is not the same it's way more cliquey uh it's way more um hemmed in and uh the yeah. space that weeklies arts weeklies could give you i mean has not been filled there's nothing there's nothing similar to what what we used to happen in arts weeklies around you know i would go to portland i would go to san diego i would go to nashville and these free weeklies were doing God's work. And believe me, I know what God is doing. And it, I mean, I don't want to relate this to a deity, but for me, I'm just some asshole with an Instagram account. 
that's that's I, people are reading about me in the village voice obviously they're 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 coming to the novels through an instagram account which is really quite strange i wouldn't have predicted it but that's what's happening i mean it's fantastic i mean even you and i we've never met in person that's true Ours is an entirely electronic Instagram-based friendship with well, FaceTime. Well, not Instagram. We talk on FaceTime all the time. Yeah, yeah. And um, I was hoping that this event would have some of the texture of our rather profane conversations on, on, on FaceTime. Does it? Do you think it does? Uh, a bit. I mean, the problem with Zoom is you have to take turns uh, in a way that's a little bit stricter because the, the, you know, the apparatus doesn't understand overlapping dialogue. And I, I think we're a little bit more outrageous in our FaceTime talks, but I, I, I'm, I'm making an effort. I will say one thing that is like our FaceTimes is that I slipped a pill right in the middle of it. And at some, <laughs> <laughs> at some point I have to say, William, I'm going to go to sleep. <laughs> well, you know, we did a chapbook. <laughs> we did a chapbook that was based on our conversations. Maybe I've got an idea now. We should do a book together, a real book, and call it the Ambient Dialogues. <laughs> I'm all for it. <laughs> Send me three months worth of it, and I'm there. I mean, I'm very proud of that chapbook. Um, the chapbook was a promotional item if, if you if you pre-ordered oh there it is so if you pre-ordered um here it is i i should have known i'm better. not just a faggot i'm a faggot like william e jones and which was actually a piece of fan art that was made by an artist named sufian ababri who lives he lives in paris now but he is from morocco and he's and, so cute yeah he's a very handsome man and he has a lovely instagram account and he, he made this amazing piece of art about me in this long series he's done of, of faggots in culture. And I was very honored. So I got to use it as the cover of this, of this chat book. William, can you show them my favorite page? Yes. Luther and Judy. Yeah. So this double, double, double picture in the uh, book, it's on the top, Luther Price, Garhar Clown. And on the bottom, Judy Garland on The Tonight Show singing, what's she singing? Uh, After the Holidays. After the Holidays, in front of a kind of hallucinogenic background of I'm, life. I'm so proud of this book and so proud of that page, in particular, Luther Price and Judy Garland together. So we will return to this. Let's do the ambient dialogues. <laughs> will Semio text do it? I have no idea, but somebody will do it. Hetty, we love you if you're out there. Yeah. I, I have Ambien and I'm ready to go. <laughs> That's what I love to hear. Okay. Well, let's, um, I guess we'll wrap this up now. Derek can go to sleep and maybe William's internet will come back. <laughs> um, I just got a text message from Spectrum saying, Service has been restored. Those motherfuckers. What a timing. What they knew timing. we were doing this. They knew it. Thank you so I, much for having us. Thank you, thank Derek. You. And thank you, William. It was a yeah. really great time. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And uh, we hope to see you all soon. Maybe sometime we'll see you all in person, too. Merry Christmas. Good night. Good night. Good night.